Good morning. Well, welcome back to Zion. Thanks for coming out this morning. It is Reformation Day, and so uh, we've got red on the altar today. Today's the day we celebrate uh, the, the Reformation. So 1517, October 31st, Luther nails the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, and uh, that's why we celebrate it at the end of October every year. So we're blessed to do that today, sing some Reformation hymns. I'm Pastor Kale, serving with Vicar Brandon and Seminarian Luke this morning. Glad to have you here if you're online or here in person. Let's begin with our opening hymn. <laughs> As you're able, please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. Receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Holy Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. Kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. 
I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You may be seated for our hymn, uh, which was written by Martin Luther about Psalm 46, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. 
And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading today comes from Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the Alleluia in verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We now profess our common Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty.
Please be seated for our sermon hymn. grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are a hiker or a backpacker, you will know something about one of my favorite feelings in the entire world. Uh, it is right when you pull into camp or pull back or get back to your car or get to wherever your destination is for the day <laughs> and you get to take the backpack off. It is a great feeling. It's a little bit cold sometimes if it's sweaty and a cool day and your back is, is full of sweat, but it is the best feeling in the entire world. And if you don't know that, if you're not a hiker or a backpacker, you can get this feeling, at least part of it, in other places. You know, if you've ever held a baby for a long time and they start getting heavy or something like that. Or if, uh, uh, if you've helped somebody move and you put down something that is, uh, that, that's pretty heavy. Or, I mean, frankly, if you've ever headed to school and you've got a whole bunch of books in your backpack and the backpack itself is heavy. But something different happens when you've been carrying a, a weight, a load, all day long. What happens is, it, it's kind of a strange thing. You sort of forget you have it on. I mean, you know it's back there and you know it's heavy, but you just kind of get used to the weight. You get used to how heavy it is. And that part of the experience helps us to understand something about what Jesus tells us when he says that he sets us free. See, in our gospel reading in John chapter 8, Jesus is talking to these people who John says had believed in him. So it's not super clear where these people are faith-wise as they're having this conversation with Jesus. But as he's talking to them, he says something that they don't like very much. And what he says is this. He says, uh, the truth will set you free. Or, sorry, what he says is this, is the, uh, the famous quote. Uh, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so it's a nice quote, right? You hear that quote outside the Bible a lot, at least that last part. The truth will set you free. But that's the part that these guys who are talking to him have a problem with. And what they do is they respond with, well, hold the phone a minute, Jesus. What do you mean the truth will set you free? What they say is, we are offspring of Abraham, and, and, and we've never been enslaved to anybody. And I have to admit, that part of the reading always makes me chuckle just a little bit whenever we do it, because, I mean, you look back to the Old Testament, and there was hardly a time when they were not enslaved to somebody. 
right? First you got the Egyptians in the Exodus, and then a couple hundred years later, the Assyrians come in, and then the Persians take over for the Assyrians, and the, uh, uh, the Greeks take over for the Persians. And in case you think to yourself that, you know, these guys were, were all in the past, uh, that, they were, that the, all the, the enslavement and captivity was in the past, when Jesus is having this conversation with these people, it's the Romans who are in charge of Israel. And so what a strange and an untrue thing to say, that they've never been enslaved to anybody. I think what's happening here is something very akin to getting used to a heavy backpack. You carry a load for so long that you don't even really realize you're doing it anymore. Now our own enslavement, our own burden is a little bit different from theirs. Theirs was in the world, ours is spiritual. But I'll be honest, it's still pretty heavy. When you're carrying a backpack, at least on a long hike, you kind of forget how heavy it is, but still there are these little signs that there's that burden back there. So your shoulders will start to hurt, or your hip belt will start to rub, or your feet will start to ache. And there's all, there are all these little reminders of this big burden you're carrying, but you don't even really remember that you have on. You don't even notice most of the time. The same thing happens in our lives, too, with our spiritual burden. I mean, we get these little signs as well that we have this burden that we're carrying. Guilt starts to creep up on you. Regret starts to seep in for something that you've done in the past. Shame about how you acted or what you did. Self-loathing that makes you wonder how you could have ever done something that is so horrible or fear, maybe, that nobody will want to talk to you if they knew. And maybe that one even extends to God himself. And all of that stuff is a reminder of this heavy burden that you and I don't even realize that we are carrying through this life most of the time. It's the burden of our sin, of course. And I'll tell you, it's no small thing. In fact, I think it would be fair to say, I don't think it's going too far, to say that the whole Reformation, all of it, this pivotal event in church history, it all came down to one guy who was feeling crushed under this burden and who was wrestling with the fear and the anger that came along with it. See, the church had lost the gospel. I mean, pure and simple, the church had lost the gospel. And what it had done, what what it had done is something that's going to sound very theological, but is actually really, really practical in our lives. What the church had done is it had mixed the truth of the gospel, the truth of grace as a gift, with the lie that human beings have something to do with our salvation. In other words, what the church would say is something like this. Before Luther, what the church would say is something like, God is going to be gracious and he's going to be merciful, but you got to do your part for salvation too. And that doesn't sound like very much when you say it that way, but I'll tell you, if you take that seriously, that is a horrible and a soul-crushing burden. I mean, think about it for a minute. You've got to do your part. I mean, you've you got to do your part or, you're go to, or you'll go to hell. That's what the church was saying. And here's the problem. If you believe that, if you really buy into that, that you've got to do your part, that you have something to do with God saving you, then there will always, 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 when you dig deep enough, there will always be this nagging question in your mind, have I done enough? Have I done enough? You'll ask that question with your eternal soul at stake. It is a big deal. And I'll tell you, that was Luther before the Reformation. He was always asking that question, always asking, have I done enough? Have I been good enough? Have I prayed enough? Have I obeyed enough? Have I been faithful enough? Have I confessed enough? And he was never, ever, ever sure that the answer to any of those questions was yes. He'd look at himself, and he'd look back at all of his sins of thought, word, and deed, And he'd figure that it could not possibly be enough to save him. So he would spend hours confessing. He would spend hours in penance and hours in prayer. All so that one day he could answer that question with, yes, I've done enough. But here's the thing. If you know anything about idols, if you know anything about bad theology, if you know anything about lies about God, they are never, ever, ever satisfied. They're never satisfied. It is never enough. You can never feed them enough. And so that day would never come for Luther. It would never come, and it didn't. It never came. But what happened was something totally different. 
There was this moment where God brought, it, brought the pure gospel to him. It just clicked for Luther. He was, he was thinking about Romans, and it just clicked one day that the righteousness that, that Romans was talking about, it talks about it in our reading for this morning, the righteousness of God was not a standard that he had to live up to. Rather, it was a gift. It was a gift given by God through Jesus, free of all cost for you and me. And that break, breakthrough moment, it came pretty early in his career as a professor, and it changed everything for him. He went from anger at God. In fact, toward the ends of his life, he writes about this experience. And what he says is, not only did I not love God, I hated him. I was angry at him. That a God could be so cruel as to, to make, make me jump through these hoops. He goes from that to the love of God and joy and peace and all that stuff like, the, the, like a light switch. And why? Because he realized that God had taken the burden off his shoulders. He finally got to put it down. That's the very foundation of Christianity. We are at the bedrock when we talk about that. It's that your burden, the one that you have grown so used to carrying that you don't even realize it's there anymore, that burden gets lifted off of you and put on Jesus' shoulders on the cross. It's gone. And so, your fear that nobody would love you if they knew what you did, gone. Gone because you have a God who loved you so much that he sent Jesus. Your anger at a God who wants to punish, it's gone. Because you have a God who wants to forgive. Your guilt and your shame and your self-loathing and your regret and your fear, all of them, gone, 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 gone. They are thrown as far as the east is from the west by a God who paid for your sin and loves you so much that he would spare no cost to make you his. So that you could be free so that your burden could be removed. See, that's what Jesus means when he says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It means that all the stuff that you were carrying, Jesus took with him and carried with his cross to Calvary. And it got nailed up there with him so that you don't have to carry it anymore. And neither do I. And that's freedom. That's the freedom that he's talking about in John chapter 8. Or at least it's part of the freedom. See, there's another aspect to freedom that he's talking about here too. Now for me, and this will sound kind of weird, for me, I think of this other aspect of freedom every time I'm driving on 255 to Collinsville. Which again, sounds kind of like a, a bit of a weird thing to say, but hear me out, here's what I mean. I, I'm a road trip guy. I love to drive, I love to drive long distances, I love to drive places. And when I, when I drive on 255 down to Collinsville, you get to the intersection at 270, and you see these road signs. And what they say on it, they're directing you onto 270, and what they say on it is Indianapolis and Memphis. And what happens when I see those signs for me is even if I'm not going far away, I'm reminded that I could. I'm reminded that that's where the road could carry me. See, that's the freedom that comes after you've been unburdened. It's the freedom of possibility. Now often people don't think about Christianity in that way, as, as giving freedom and giving possibility. Rather, most people think about it the other way, that religion is restrictive. But in fact, it is exactly the opposite of that. See, part of being unburdened by your sin means being given new life. When you come to faith, you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you are reborn. You're brought to life, and that opens up possibilities that just weren't there before. And in fact, it opens you up to the best things. Paul calls them the fruits of the Spirit. In, in other words, the results of your faith, the things that come out of you because you live this new life. And it's all the stuff we want to be, all of us. It's the kind of life we want to live when you hear what Paul says about that. It's as if in your interactions that you have in your life, you come to this crossroads. And on the road signs are the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. So when you're dealing with a coworker that nobody can stand, you're at the crossroads and you are freed to treat them as God treated you. When you get a call from a friend who needs to talk because there's something going on in their life, you find yourself at a crossroads and you are free to hear them and to support them just as God hears and supports you. And I'll tell you, most especially, most especially when there's somebody who is showing signs that they are carrying an awful burden. When you hear somebody who feels guilt sneaking up on them, 
or when somebody close to you voices regret for something in their past, when you sense a feeling of shame of, or self-loathing for something that they did, when that creeps into their actions or their words, when the people around you feel unlovable and afraid of how everybody else is going to look at them, you are freed to speak the words that set them free. And that is something you cannot do without the spirit that Christ gave you. Only a freed person can free others. And I'll tell you, guys, I'm betting that sometime this week you are going to meet somebody who is burdened, whether you know it or not. You're going to meet somebody who's burdened, somebody who could benefit from the forgiveness of a God that lifts burdens off of our backs. You're going to meet somebody who, who would really benefit from being here today in church, hearing about the Word of God and freedom in Christ. So bring them. Bring them along. If you're streaming, invite them over for breakfast in church on the back porch next week. Or if you're here in the service, bring them along with you. Because here's the thing. You know the truth. You know the truth, and the truth has set you free, which means that you can set them free as well. You know the truth that can bring them freedom, and that can bring them into a life that all of us want to live, a life filled with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. The Son set you free, and you are free indeed, and so now as we walk out of here, we go and we share our joy and our peace and our freedom in Jesus with a burdened world that absolutely needs it. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen.